the culture really drives the attitude that pills will fix ills. A special report, our kids on drugs. We've seen 24 children who have been admitted to hospital with the severe side effects of clonidine. Why are doctors prescribing drugs that have never been approved for use on children? I'm pretty convinced that there is no such thing as a single disorder called ADHD. Is it possible for children to train their brains to overcome behaviour problems? And is childhood depression the next epidemic? I'm alive today because of Eli Lilly and Effexor and Lithium. Hello, welcome to Catalyst. I'm Karina Kelly. Tonight's program is devoted to one issue of importance to all Australians. The epidemic of childhood behaviour disorders and the growing use of drugs to treat them. Are children being misdiagnosed? We'll see what can go wrong when kids are put on adult medications and look to what's coming next, children on Prozac. First up, ADHD. On average, one child in every classroom in the nation is diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Their parents face an agonising decision to use drugs or not. These boys both suffer from learning and behavioural disorders. Their mothers might be sisters, but they have radically different views on using drugs to treat their child. I've placed him on the medication and I can see a totally different little boy. As a parent, I don't believe that we should be hammered into putting our children on stimulants unless it's the only alternative you have. When Patrick was a toddler, he was impulsive and accident prone. He was diagnosed with dyspraxia, a learning and motor skill disorder. Yeah, this is at Snowy's. Uh huh. And there he is with a, yeah, he's a little bit of a 18, scar on his eye there. 18 months old, I think. But his erratic behaviour really started to cause problems when he got to school. Well, straight away they thought he had ADD and they told me that they'd like to have him assessed. Irene was told Patrick had Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD, and he was prescribed stimulants. First Ritalin, then later Dexamphetamine. And the drugs seemed to work. Now he has the concentration to sit there and complete the tasks of his homework and do it beautifully. Wow! What did you get? Patrick's improved behaviour has been rewarded with his first school prize, bringing an obvious boost to his self-esteem. Tell me, what do you got in your hand? Show me. Oh, wow, showing enthusiasm for learning and making very good progress. Vivian's son, Jared, also has dyspraxia. It's affected his learning ability and caused frustration and behavioural problems at school. Some of them tease me, swear words and lose on that. So it doesn't really bother me now. But Vivian is strongly anti-drugs. She voices a common perception that stimulants are harmful and represent a quick fix. I'd rather do it the hard way, using natural therapies changing the diet, making sure there's no artificial preservatives and colourings and flavours, and the basic diet that I was brought up with, and lots of outdoor activities. Ready? One! And change legs! One! Oh! Instead of drugs, Jared gets motor skill training, speech therapy, cranial massage, and naturopathic treatments. I don't want to see him conforming to society. I'm happy for my son to progress the way he's progressing. I believe that drugs are there for some people, but they're not for everybody. But for the most part, the medical profession doesn't agree with her. How do we determine that someone has ADHD? Dr. Paul DSM Hutchins is one of Australia's leading ADHD experts. He regularly talks to teachers on the use of stimulants to treat behavioural problems. Research shows that a significant part of why children have difficult behaviour is part of how their brains work. 
In other words, the neurochemistry and neurophysiology of the brain and medications can correct some of that or improve it. Neurological research backs this up. Scans of brainwave activity show that children with ADHD are different. When compared with other children, ADHD children have slower brain waves in the frontal cortex, shown here in red. This is the part of the brain that controls concentration and planning. Researchers believe ADHD kids have too little dopamine in this part of their brains. Dopamine is a chemical messenger that travels between neurons, exciting brain activity. Stimulant drugs boost the release of dopamine, speeding up brainwave activity, allowing ADHD kids to focus and concentrate like other children. But there is a downside. Stimulants often have side effects. In fact, Irene has become so concerned about some of Patrick's side effects that she's taking him back to his paediatrician. Well, Pat, you tell doctor how you feel when you... Um, sometimes I feel um, sad and other times I feel um, a bit sleepy. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's hardly ever at night. Right. What makes you sad? Um, kind of really nothing. We've got three side effects here with this now. We've got the mood changes, we've got problems with sleep, and we've got problems with appetite. Patrick's doctor suggests trying him on a different drug. It's a worrying time for Irene. But Vivian's drug-free approach also has its problems. She's regularly called to the school to deal with Jared's disruptive behaviour, like walking out of class, kicking teachers and throwing stones. She feels under increasing pressure to put Jared on drugs. And so, is, has anybody suggested to you that um, drug therapy would be a useful thing for him? Yes, and that's money coming from the um, staff from the Department of Education. So they're suggesting that that's that that's that's the answer that for them. Yeah. And, and um, what's your uh, what's your um, response to that suggestion? Uh, my response is no. Okay, Jared. <laughs> The Department of Education denies that they promote the use of stimulants, but Vivian seems to be fighting an uphill battle. The school has had Jared independently diagnosed as having oppositional defiance disorder, and he was recently suspended from school. It's hard knowing what's right for your child at the best of times. And at a time of distrust of drug companies and conflicting consumer advice, it makes the decision for parents agonising. I'm really sitting on the fence because, you know, we haven't seen a long-term result. You know, I, I don't know what to... How do you measure it? Do you measure it in his behaviour while he's on it is fine, but then his personality and his moods are altered, so what's the better of the two evils, you know? With parents worrying over the best way to treat children with ADHD, it's quite a shock to hear that many of them could have been misdiagnosed. Graham Phillips reports on new research to help better identify ADHD sufferers and teach children how to teach their brain to look after itself. <laughs> Does Xavier have attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder? He certainly has a lot of the symptoms. He's always on the go, he can't concentrate, and he causes a lot of trouble at school. Always very disruptive in class situations, quite rude to some of the other teachers, that's what it was getting like. Xavier can't even sit still long enough to eat lunch. Are you eating under there, Xavier? Many doctors wouldn't hesitate to diagnose Xavier with ADHD and put him on the usual stimulant medication. But that could be a misdiagnosis, says Richard Silverstein. This brainwave researcher at Swinburne University of Technology says many kids like Xavier don't actually have ADHD. They've just been lumped under that grab-all label. I'm pretty convinced that there is no such thing as a single disorder called ADHD.
there are a, a family of different underlying processes that can give rise to things that can be labelled ADHD. Kids like Xavier certainly need treatment, Richard says. But if they're not suffering actual classic ADHD, stimulant medication may not be the best treatment. An alternative therapy could be better. If their underlying causes are different, then the way that you've got to treat them, the optimum treatment for them, would differ. Now, I've already explained what we're going to do. We're going to do like a brain map, right? But before considering an alternative treatment, how do you know if your child does have ADHD? An EEG brain scan helps answer that, say the Swinburne researchers. Jacques Duff is a psychologist and one of Richard's PhD students. A computer program will compare Xavier's brain scan with a database of scans of ADHD sufferers. If he does have the condition, the ADHD diagnosis will be automatically triggered. But Xavier's results gave a surprise. It didn't quite trigger it. His attention deficits are probably the result of something else. That something else is likely to be anxiety or depression, suspect Shark. And it's that that's making Xavier negative, not ADHD. He doesn't have enough fast alpha brain waves on the right side of his brain. We would like to see more alpha waves in the right hand side than on the left, because we know that if there's more alpha waves in the left hand side of the brain, there's a tendency um, towards predicting the negative in situations, seeing things negatively. In other words, it's someone with a, the, where the cup is half empty. So Xavier doesn't need ADHD stimulant medication. He needs his anxiety and depression treated, says Jacques. And that can be done with neurotherapy. Neurotherapy is a type of EEG biofeedback where you essentially teach people to change the brainwave patterns um, and to change them in a way that is more like the normal pattern that you get. Remember, not enough fast waves on the right side of Xavier's brain is the problem. Excellent. It's solved by feeding his brain waves into a computer game via scalp electrodes. The goal is for Xavier to make the green rocket stay ahead of the purple one, just by concentrating. The game helps normalise his brain waves because the green rocket is pushed ahead whenever Xavier produces the needed fast waves. When the usual slow waves kick back in, the purple rocket takes over. This purple one, which is your slow wave activity, is increasing. So when that happens, you just hold concentration until it goes back again, like that. And this biofeedback for the brain could make real biological changes, says Jacques. If we can teach them to control that slow wave activity, we may be altering the neuronal networks that are responsible for producing them. So we're teaching the brain to look after itself. Here again, it shows up a lack of delta, and that's quite... Jacques even takes the brainwave analysis further and says it gives other clues about Xavier's problems. What is important in this case is that this lack of very, very slow wave delta activity suggests that this child may be lacking serotonin. So he might be low on serotonin. And that would mean that he doesn't get the feel-good feelings that is associated with producing serotonin. Tablet time. Jacques prescribes nutrients to Xavier to naturally boost his serotonin levels. Typically, we're looking at things like vitamin B12, B6, uh, B3, the big group vitamins, but particularly B12. But the big question over this brainwave treatment is, does it really work? A number of positive small studies have been done on it. But there have been no expensive large-scale trials like the drugs routinely undergo. The way I look at it is I'm going to know myself whether it's working for my son, and I believe it is. It's not going to hurt him in any way, um, and I'm willing to do that at this stage. Neurotherapy also takes a lot of time and money. It is expensive. It's, you know, $85 a session. Xavier's at this stage doing three sessions a week um, and he's you know he's going to be doing it for at least six months I think it's an approach whose time is coming whether it's the ultimate panacea no I don't think it is there is no one panacea there's going to be a whole series of different approaches which will include stimulant medication <laughs> 
Meanwhile, the search to find new drug solutions for ADHD continues unabated. Now doctors are prescribing some adult medications that have never been approved for use on children. Paul Willis reports on the growing dangers of chemical solutions. He was on four doses of Clondine a day and I gave him his after school medication one afternoon. And by about oh, six o'clock or so, I started noticing I was getting very weak, very ill, very nauseous. Mark's pulse dropped below 40 beats per minute. His mother was so alarmed, she called an ambulance. Oh, I was terrified. Absolutely terrified. I kept passing out on several occasions because my blood pressure was getting to a point of basically almost death. I phoned my paediatrician uh, the morning after he was admitted and told him what had happened. And he immediately agreed with me that my son would have no more clonidine. Dr. Noel Cranswick is the clinical pharmacologist at Melbourne Royal Children's Hospital. He's investigating a disturbing increase in the number of clonidine or catapress overdoses. This is the consumer medicine's information. Dr. Cranswick believes that because clonidine is now being prescribed to more and more children for ADHD, it's getting into the wrong hands. Most of the overdoses are children either taking their own drug in overdose or a drug prescribed for another child, either a sibling or a friend. But he's also seen cases like Mark's, where adverse reactions occur with prescribed doses, and he's concerned that the effects on children are so unpredictable. The manufacturer of clonidine has never marketed it for use on children. So how has it come to be used so widely on kids with ADHD? In a disorder such as attention deficit disorder, there are some children who weren't responding to the drugs that were available. One of those problems was sleeping at night. Clinicians were aware that clonidine does have that as a side effect, does make people sleepy, and so clinicians may have just started using it. Once one or two clinicians found that it was effective, they told their colleagues, reported it at meetings, and its use became more widespread. Remarkably, this process is not the exception, but the rule. In fact, almost 80% of prescription drugs have never been tested on children. This means doctors are forced to rely on the results of adult trials when prescribing drugs for kids. And that has obvious dangers. Children are not small adults in that they're growing, their brains are growing, and there's always the question of what effects is the drug having on, say, the growing brain or the developing body. A solution isn't as easy as forcing drug companies to test all drugs on kids. There are major obstacles getting children to participate in drug trials. And for a medical system geared to finding a drug solution to all problems, not giving children drugs isn't an option either. To not give ch a child access to a drug just because we don't have any studies, then most of the children we treat wouldn't be able to be treated appropriately. It's not an absolute but unfortunately that's the process that we have to use at the moment. And a note of caution, if you have a child on clonidine, you must consult your doctor before making any changes to their medication. Our final story looks at what's coming next as medicine targets the emotional problems of our children. As Graham Phillips reports, once again, the pressure is on to put our kids on drugs. What it is. What it feels like. In America, it's routine to see ads for antidepressants on TV. They've been given to adults for years. Now, children as young as four are being put on these Prozac-like drugs. Will childhood depression be the next epidemic here? Paxil, your life is waiting. Good to see you. Good to see you. Yep. Oh, boy. Chris is 13 and he's having major problems at home and school. And how's the year ended up since I last saw you? Five, five subjects. 
last night. Huh? Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. Well, it, it, a lot of it was um, not assessed because he didn't do the work. I'd like you to copy. Chris has lost interest because he's depressed, says his psychiatrist, Alistair Vance. At the end of her tether, Mum Anne has made the difficult decision of supplementing Chris's counselling with drugs. Just keep your head still and follow my finger. But every parent's worry is, is Chris's medication really necessary? Or has he just been sucked into the latest kids on drugs epidemic? At his book launch, Melbourne psychiatrist George Halas says we are being blindly dragged into the American model. And it's vital we debate this now before it's too late. The culture really drives the attitude that pills will fix ills. By but not everyone saw it as George did. I come from a family where suicide is rife. Everyone, apart from my mother, who also, all the suicides on her side, is medicated to the eyeballs. And yes, that has cured me. I'm alive today because of Eli Lilly and Effexor and Lithium. Fiona ambushed George's book launch because she believes many kids need to be on antidepressants. Fiona was depressed for most of her childhood and now on medication, she believes the drugs correct a real chemical deficiency in her brain, making her emotions normal again. The misconception that a lot of people have is that if you're on antidepressants, you can't get depressed. Uh, which actually isn't true, but you tend to only get depressed for a reason. So for the same reasons that other people might get depressed if you break up with a boyfriend or have a bad day at work, you'll still get down. And there is some scientific evidence to back up what Fiona says. Positron emission tomography brain scans show some depressed people do have altered brain chemistry. And antidepressants convert that chemistry back to normal. Fiona believes if she went on antidepressants as a young child, her cycle of depression may have been broken. Depression um, leads to more depression. As a child, when you become depressed, then you're a depressed person to be around. You don't have much fun at school. Um, you don't have an easy time with friends. You become more depressed. And perhaps if I'd been helped as a child, I wouldn't be needing to be on antidepressants for life now. But putting kids on mind-altering drugs could be dangerous. Abby went on antidepressants at 16 and says she's now hooked. Trying to cut the medications down even gradually leads to vomiting, balancing problems, headaches and more, she claims. At this stage, I'm just, I'm just too petrified to try and cut it down anymore because those symptoms are just, you know, when I, when I went cold turkey, I just, I felt like I was going to die and at the time, I wished it would happen pretty quickly because it was just horrendous and I'm just, I'm too scared to, to try it again. Abby now regrets going on antidepressants. And while the vast majority of people don't have her withdrawal problems, science doesn't fully understand how these drugs affect the mind. All they know is they boost one of the brain's main chemicals, serotonin. Serotonin is one of the chemical messengers one brain cell uses to communicate with another. It ferries signals across the gap between the brain cells, the synapse. Serotonin's created on one side, and normally, once it's got to the other side and delivered its message, it's reabsorbed and disappears. But take an antidepressant, and reabsorption is slowed down, bathing the brain in serotonin, and the theory is that makes the person happier. But no one knows that for sure. Indeed, so little is known antidepressants could even be little more than placebos. Why is this pills will fix ills culture being pushed on us? Surprisingly, George doesn't blame the drug companies. He blames psychiatry itself. It's inventing ever more and ever finer categories of mental disorder. This reductionist attitude would say, provided you refine your categories, eventually you'll find pure faults. Just look at the Psychiatry Bible, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM. This is the latest version of the DSM. The first one came out in the 1950s, and there were less than 100 childhood mental diseases. By the 1980s, that number had crept up to 250, and now there are more than 400. These days, chronic shyness is a mental disorder. 
so is oppositional defiant behaviour and conduct disorder, not doing what you're told, and there are many others. The logic that drives such a process is that if you have a category, then you may be able to find a drug which assists that category, and sooner or later someone will say it's actually the treatment for that disease. And this gradual erosion of logic from man-made categories to designating the constellation of symptoms as disease is part of the sociology of psychiatry in the last 50 years. And of course this has been a gold mine for the pharmaceutical companies. Meanwhile, Chris is now off his antidepressants and they do seem to have helped. I'm doing all right now, but I'm a bit behind in certain English, but that's not that far behind. It's not huge like he's going to go to school and do his work and he's going to behave and he's going to do this and he's going to do that. But he's coping really well with the ups and downs of things. With the ups and downs for today's children only set to get worse, could putting kids on Prozac be the next big decision many parents will have to face? And that's all for Catalyst tonight. Next week, a new treatment that one in five Australians would dearly love. This promises to be a long-term cure to insomnia. It looks like torture. I'll let her sleep for four minutes and then wake her up again. But can sleep deprivation actually help you get a good night's sleep? That's coming up on Catalyst next Thursday at 8 o'clock. I'll see you then. Good night.